How's everybody's veg fest going so far? All right, well, so one of the cool things about being on the veg fest board is you get all the emails that come in about potential speakers. And when the email came in about Dr. Aisha Akhtar, she was the one I knew I had to have at this fest. Like, people get excited about different speakers and they come out to hear particular speakers. She's the one I want to hear today. Um, I'm so thrilled and honored that she is choosing to spend her day with us. Um, so I want to just give a brief introduction about her. Um, she's an MD and an MPH and a neurologist and public health specialist on a mission to show that what's good for animals is also good for humans. She's the author of Animals and Public Health, Why Treating Animals Better is Critical to Human Welfare. She's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, and she gave a TED Talk on the link between animals and human health. She works, super impressively, for the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats of the FDA. She also serves as the Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Public Health Service, and she is a Fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. The title of her talk is Animal Protection is Human Protection Too. Welcome, Aisha. relationship with all animals, a relationship that was certainly better for the animals. 
But here's the best thing. This relationship was also much better for us. Now, more than 20 years later, by adopting a vegan way of living, my family is much healthier. All four of my father's brothers died from heart disease and stroke in their 50s and 60s. My father is 78 years old, and he's still going strong. My mother is 70 years old, but she has the looks and energy of someone much younger. And my sister's debilitating migraines stop after she cut out dairy. So the benefits my family experienced caused me to ask a larger question. Do we as a society benefit from treating animals with basic kindness and respect? <clears throat> and so many of you are here today because you may be curious about vegetarianism, may be thinking about it for health reasons. And many of you are here today because you truly care about the suffering of animals. And I bet that at some point you've been asked this question. How can you care about animals when there are so many humans suffering? And you have probably found yourself having to defend your concern for animals, right? There's this weird tendency to think that we're in some sort of competition with animals. That we can either use our resources and time to protect humans from harm or protect animals. You guys may have heard this phrase, it's your child or your dog. In other words, we've been led to believe that we have to make a choice. It's us or the animals. But over the course of my career in medicine and public health, I found that we're not in competition with animals. It's quite the opposite. Our fates are shared with those with animals. What I found is this. It's not us or them. It's us and them. When we save animals, we save ourselves. And when we hurt animals, we hurt ourselves too. In fact, many of our most urgent public health threats are connected with the way we treat animals. Every day, thousands of animals are experimented on in windowless basement laboratories, but the evidence shows that these experiments are outdated and actually preventing us from finding the cure as we so desperately seek. Every week, millions of animals are slaughtered for our consumption, but we discovered that the animal food industry contributes more to greenhouse gases than all the world's planes, trains, and automobiles combined. And every year, billions of animals are ripped from their habitats and shipped around the globe, and used as exotic pets, for meat and for circuses. But we know that this trade in animals is the reason why we have SARS, HIV, and Ebola. You guys might be hearing about the news today where it's been um, declared that, uh, I think it's New Guinea, is free from Ebola today. Remember last year when the epidemic was raging across Western Africa? Um, we watched in horror as thousands of people died from Ebola. And while the epidemic is thankfully over, we are far from free from Ebola. It is a virus that is constantly mutating. We normally catch Ebola when we hunt, butcher, and eat wild animals like wild pigs, monkeys, and bats from the African bush. And while this bush meat trade has existed for a long time, it's been drastically ramped up in recent years. Now, wealthier urban populations create a strong demand for this exotic meat. And as we clear cut the forest for our logging industries and to create new pig farms, we make access to wild animals and the viruses they carry easier than ever before. And as we ship these animals around the globe, we're shipping their viruses too. As we invade deeper and deeper into the forests and jungles to seize animals for the trade, we risk exposure to rarely encountered animals who may carry viruses that are entirely new to the human population. And this is how we got HIV. Before 1981, no one had ever heard of HIV. But we suspect that we got it, the first person got infected through the bushmeat trade. Now, the bushmeat trade is just one part, though, of a much, much larger wildlife trade, where animals are either caught in the wild or they're bred in captivity. They are then sold to be used as exotic pets, for their skins, for their fur, and to be used in experimentation and entertainment like uh, circuses and zoos. Every animal you can imagine is up for grabs. Lions, tigers, bears, bats, snakes, birds, um, you know, foxes, you name it. If there's an animal out there, it's fair game for the wildlife trade. 
And these animals suffer tremendously as they, as they are passed from dealer to dealer and either shipped overseas or is killed on site in profoundly painful ways. Now imagine for a moment you are one of these animals going about your business and suddenly you are kidnapped from your home and perhaps your family. You have no understanding of what's happening to you. And you would be extremely terrified. And your immune system would be down. And you would have a hard time fighting off infections. And this is what happens to the animals. The wildlife trade creates and brings together a lot of very different and very sick animals. Ideal conditions for pathogens to pass on from animal to animal and ultimately to humans. And this is how we got SARS. It was through the wildlife trade. SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome, the virus originates from wild fruit bats, at least that's what we think. Fruit bats were caught through the wildlife trade. And at some point in the trade, they were brought into contact with these animals called civet cats. Civet cats are also caught in the trade and they're exploited for their must producing kinds. And because these animals are so miserable, it was so easy for the pathogen, for the SARS coronavirus, to pass on from fruit bats to different animals and ultimately to civet cats. And then it passed on ultimately to humans in the open markets in China. In the past few decades, we have seen a drastic rise in the number of new infectious diseases. Most of these come from animals. But it's not the animal's fault. They are victims of a very brutal business that makes it easy for pathogens to pass on to humans. And if you think we here in the U.S. are safe from these viruses, <coughs> let me dispel that myth. Um, you know, when, when Ebola was raging across Western Africa, our government was so terrified of it that it urgently and rapidly mounted a national Ebola response. And as a lieutenant commander in the public health service, I was deployed to assist with that response. For months, we screened every person who came into the U.S. from Western Africa for Ebola, thinking that would protect us. But what about the more than one million animals who enter U.S. ports every year? The U.S. is the largest importer of wild animals. And with only about 140 inspection officers nationwide, less than a fourth of the wildlife imports get physically inspected. And of those that do get inspected, they get mostly a very rudimentary glance. So it is very easy for animals carrying deadly pathogens to slip into the country. Now this is a gaping, gaping crack in our public health army. Because of the wildlife trade, no one anywhere is safe from deadly pathogens. In fact, every human life now is impacted by the way we treat animals. And nowhere is this more apparent than in our eating habits. No one wants to think about this, but most of us here in this room are going to die from a chronic disease. Heart disease and stroke make up the majority of deaths worldwide. Entire families are dying from these diseases. And cancer is not far behind. But we're not dying because we inherited our mother's DNA. No, we're dying because we inherited our mother's cookbook. <laughs> Except now, we need more animals than our parents ever did. Each American will eat about 7,000 animals in his or her lifetime. And for every human on this planet, there are more than 70 billion of us. For every, I'm sorry, 7 billion of us. For every human on this planet, there are more than 10 land animals raised and killed for food for, at any given moment. And we've got human overpopulation as well. So that is a massive, massive industry. And the days of family farms are now long gone. And in their place, we have factory farms. Chickens, pigs, and turkeys now live here. These animals are so jam-packed into these sheds that fans have to circulate the air to keep these animals from suffocating. They are constantly breathing in fecal matter, ammonia from their urine, and pathogens that are circulating in the air. If you were to spend just two hours inside one of these farms, your lungs and eyes would burn, would burn with the scent of urine. And that is two hours. Imagine, just imagine for a moment what it must be for the animals that live their entire lives here, albeit very short ones. And by causing animals to suffer, we cause ourselves to suffer. 
Our high consumption of animal products made cheap by modern industry is killing us. We are getting chronic illnesses at younger ages than our parents ever did. Now, one in three of us between the ages of 40 and 60 have heart disease. One in three of us, and we don't even know it. Most of us don't even know it. One American dies from a stroke every four minutes. And I'm sure you guys know, just a few weeks ago, the World Health Organization announced that after uh, evaluating more than 800 studies, that red and processed meat cause cancer. But it's not just red and processed meat that cause cancer. Grilled chicken has carcinogens. And multiple studies highly suggest that dairy products cause breast and prostate cancer. And if the idea of dying of these diseases doesn't scare you, well, the idea of living with them should. If you were to get colon cancer, and colon cancer is the third leading cause of uh, cancer-related deaths in the US. If you were to get colon cancer, chances are you'd have to have half your colon removed. And you'd have to wear a plastic bag attached to your abdomen to collect your poop. And as a neurologist, I, start, I treat a lot of patients who had stroke, as young as their 30s. And let me tell you, you do not want to have a stroke. Most people think that heart disease is no big deal. But the same causes of heart disease are what causes stroke. And you do not want to have a stroke. You do not want to go the rest of your life half paralyzed, drooling out of the corner of your mouth, having to have someone else feed and bathe. Not only are animal products carcinogenic, not only do they cause cancer, but they are the main source of saturated fats and the only source of cholesterol in our foods. A Harvard study projects that by 2050, more than half of Americans will be obese. We're not talking about overweight, overweight here. We're talking about obese. And that was their best case scenario. Of course, animal products aren't the only causes of these chronic diseases. But we know without a doubt that animal products are certainly one of the main causes. Now, this is such a waste. I mean, we know how to prevent these illnesses. It comes down to this. If we save animals, we save ourselves. After chronic diseases, infectious diseases are most likely to kill us. When you eat meat, eggs, and dairy, you're eating something that is teeming with bacteria like E. coli and salmonella. A University of Minnesota study found harmful bacteria in two-thirds of beef and pork, and in 97% of the chicken sold in our grocery store. Um, and Consumer, um, Consumer Reports found a similar finding. Just uh, a couple months ago, they found that in their survey of ground beef sold in 26 cities throughout the country, they found bacteria in every single sample. Now, these bacteria live in the intestinal tracts of animals, and they are shed in their feces. So think about this. When your meat is contaminated with E. coli or salmonella, it's also contaminated with feces. Multiple studies have found um, and bacteria thriving in animal products long after they are nicely packaged for the grocery store. Now you know all the care you take in buying and preparing your food? Well, your food was contaminated long before you got it. <coughs> Factory farms are filthy places, and because the animals are so miserable and so stressed, their immune systems are down. And that makes factory farms a perfect breeding ground for infectious diseases. Like with the wildlife trade, sick animals make sick people. You see the pattern. And at their end of their lives, these animals are so terrified when they're slaughtered that they frequently soil themselves and they cross-contaminate other carcasses down the process anyway. In the US, we slaughter one million animals an hour. Can you imagine that? I mean, I can't even think of that. One million animals an hour. Do you honestly think that a few hundred inspection officers throughout the country, quickly glancing at these carcasses as they whiz by on the slaughter lines from protect you? Mm -mm. Of course not. We need to protect ourselves. And we can protect ourselves <coughs> if we change the way we treat animals. If we don't make this change, Joe, we will continue to hurt ourselves. Because besides becoming infected by directly eating animals, we can also, also catch infectious diseases when manure from these factory farms are spread over our crops. Now, manure used to be a good thing. 
In the past, we could take our time, bake manure in the sun, kill off the bacteria, and use it safely to nourish our crops. But now we have too much of it, and we have to find ways to get rid of it fast. A farm of 5,000 pigs produces as much feces as a city of 50,000 people. So the agribusiness solution is to hold all this manure in cesspools the size of large ponds that they call lagoons, or to spray it as this liquid sludge over our crops. And this liquid, gooey manure provides a nice, cozy environment for bacteria to thrive. Most of the bacteria that cause foodborne illnesses are intestinal bacteria. They um, live in the intestinal tracts of human beings. <coughs> Plants don't have intestines. <laughs> they don't naturally carry these bacteria. But they can become contaminated when manure, when fresh liquid manure, is spread over the fields. This year, one in six of us will get a foodborne illness. Now, we can largely prevent this if we consider the lives of animals. If, though, we continue to ignore the plight of animals, we may have an even deadlier problem on our hands. Our greatest danger may not be bacteria, like E. coli and salmonella, but a new viruses that can cause pandemics. And here, we are mostly concerned about the influenza A virus. There are three types of influenza viruses. There's influenza C, which rarely causes a problem. Influenza B, that causes the seasonal flus we get each year, and influenza A. And unlike B and C, influenza A viruses can be carried by a wide range of species in addition to, in addition to humans. For this reason, these viruses are extremely difficult to track, predict, and contain. Now, the worst pandemic in history occurred just as World War I was winding down. The 1918 influenza A virus killed more people in 25 weeks than AIDS has killed in 25 years. So for good reason, we public health folks call it the mother of all pandemics. Now the virus was able to take hold and spread quickly among the soldiers who were miserable and crowded in the muddy trenches. And like factory farms, the trenches became breeding grounds for infectious diseases. And actually, uh, since World War I, the virus, influenza virus, have remained quite stable for many years. But in recent decades, it's been rapidly mutated. <coughs> Why? Because of factory farms. Influenza A viruses originate from wild aquatic birds, so like, like wild geese and ducks. But we rarely, rarely become sick from direct contact with these animals. Something has to happen to the virus to allow it to cause harm to us. And this is where factory farms come to play. An influenza virus can easily enter a chicken or a turkey factory farm. And once it enters a bird factory farm, it can quickly transform from a very mild virus into a very deadly one. And what's worse, pigs are virus mixing vessels. They can carry influenza viruses from other pigs, from humans, and from birds. So if the situation is right, a new virus can emerge that can spread easily among people. Now, I know you guys, I'm sure you guys have heard and read about all the different swine and bird foods that keep popping up in the media. They pop up for a little while, there's a bit of a panic, oh no, what are we going to do? And then they disappear, and then we forget about them. And you might have read about the um, bird flu epidemic that swept across um, chicken farms in the U.S. this past summer. Hundreds of thousands of birds were killed by being foamed to death. We foamed them to death. But despite the tragedy of these birds, we humans have been incredibly lucky so far. If you were to catch one of the more common bird flu viruses, you would have only a 40% chance of surviving. And that's with all our modern medicine. And that is a deadly, deadly virus. Fortunately, bird flu is not being very contagious among humans. Swine flu is contagious, but has not been very deadly. So far. Because of the crowded conditions, in a factory farm, a bird or swine flu can spread from animal to animal like wildfire. Like the trenches, factory farms are incubators for the virus. Except now, instead of having sick soldiers by the thousands unable to escape the virus, we have sick animals by the billions. 
You see, the poor animals on these farms are like nightclubs for viruses. <laughs> In these animals, different viruses can get together, exchange greetings, and swap genetic material. And each time a virus passes into another animal, it can mutate into an even deadlier form. Now, despite how deadly it was, the 1918 influenza virus killed less than 5% of people who are infected. So what do you think would happen if a bird flu that kills 60% of people combined with the swine flu that spread fast? <laughs> or what would happen if Ebola became airborne? The Ebola virus that caused an epidemic in Western Africa was spread through bodily fluids. So fortunately, it was never very contagious. But a possible airborne Ebola has been found circulating among pigs in farms in the Philippines. And as you can imagine, that is bad, bad news. Because of factory farms, it is just a matter of time, just a matter of time, before a new virus emerges that has the right combination to be both deadly and contagious. And this time, we're going to find ourselves face to face with the mother-in-law of all people. <laughs> but this doesn't have to happen. We could prevent a pandemic if we change the way we treat animals. If we continue to ignore the plight of animals, we remain trapped in this never-ending cycle where the suffering we cause animals causes our own suffering. And we will continue to see infectious diseases rise at a faster and faster rate. So then, to combat these infectious diseases that we could be preventing, and other types of diseases, we experiment on more than 100 million animals each year. In the name of research, animals are poisoned, blinded, drowned, crushed, and burned. These animals live in fear every day of what we are going to do to them next. And as with the animal trade and with animal agriculture, when we hurt animals for experiments, it comes back to hurt us. Despite the fact that our government spends more than $15 billion of our tax dollars each year to experiment on animals, the evidence is shown that these outdated animal experiments are holding back medical progress. You see, the, despite the fact that we share similarities in our physiology with other animals, it's the differences that are causing the problems. Medicine is now looking at the subtle nuances of molecular biology. And the way medicine is practiced today, animal experiments are just too unreliable in telling us what we are going to find in humans. A few years ago, a British medical journal study looked at six different medical treatments. And what they did was that they compared all the animal experimental results with all the human results. And what they found was that the animal results matched the human results only 50% of the time. What that means is that the animal experiments were no more better at predicting whether those treatments were going to be safe and effective in humans than a toss of the coin. They're extremely unreliable. And unreliable animal experiments hurt us. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people fall sick from new drugs because the animal experiments misled us into believing that these drugs were going to be safe for us. And probably what's even worse is that we probably have tossed out incredibly effective treatments and maybe even cures because they did work in animals, but they would have worked wonderfully in humans. How much further do you think we would be if instead of experimenting on animals, we had used that $15 billion a year to create effective human-based technologies, like the organ on the chip. This is a human organ on the chip. It's created by the Beast Institute at Harvard. And what they're doing is that they are distilling a human organ into its molecular components onto a microchip. And everything happens at the molecular level. Drug safety and effectiveness happens at the molecular level. Disease happens at the molecular level. They have the human lung on a chip, which functions and breathes. It actually breathes like a living human lung. They're creating multiple brain human organs on a chip, and their goal is to create, link these all up and create a human body on a chip. We're even throwing human microbrains in the lab. 
This is the type of technology that we should be funding. About 10 years ago, our government admitted that um, more than 90% of the drugs that pass animal tests are proven to be unsafe or ineffective in humans. Ten years later, despite all attempts to improve animal testing, that failure rate is now close to 96%. 96% failure rate in animal testing. Now, if you were to hop on a plane and the pilot told you that we only have a 4% chance of landing safely at our destination, <laughs> I guarantee you'd hop right back off. Now, we would never accept such a dismal failure rate in any other industry. So why do we accept it when it comes to safety and effectiveness of our analysis? I think the reason why we accept it is because we still believe that we have to make a choice between helping humans or helping animals. It's time to stop thinking that way. We don't need to think that way. And we can't afford to think that way. Remember the old choice between your child or your dog? It's wrong. Not only can we save the child and the dog, but in order to save the child, we have to save the dog too. In order to save ourselves, we have to save animals. By demanding that your tax dollars be spent on cutting edge science instead of outdated animal experiments, you will help move medical research into the 21st century. By refusing to see animals as tools for our entertainment, as decorations for our bags and our coats, and exotic food for our dinner plates, you will help prevent another HIV or Ebola. And by simply choosing the plate full of delicious and healthy vegan food over that plate full of nasty bacteria and fecal ridden meat and eggs and dairy, you will single-handedly help prevent a pandemic and you'll protect yourself from the stroke, and you'll protect the environment, and you will save thousands, thousands of animals from a lifetime of suffering and an absolutely horrendous death. Now we have a new choice before us. Do we continue in this backward, never-ending loop where the suffering we cause animals comes back and causes our own suffering? Or do we stop and change course in the forward direction? Save animals and save ourselves. So imagine for a moment if we did see the destinies of humans and animals as shared. Imagine how different our world could look if we saw animals not as what, but as food. And imagine how much future how much brighter our future could be for all of us if we finally recognize that we are all humans and animals in it together. Thank you guys very much.
for the Q&A. Make sure the mic comes to you. Um, don't just pop up and speak because we are recording the talk and we want to make sure that gets captured. Um, so as you're thinking, you know, this is kind of a heavy talk, as you're thinking about what you want to ask, I'll get started. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm a vegan and I've been vegan for over 10 years and I'm vegan for the animals. And a question that often comes up for me is, well, yeah, we all know factory farms are terrible, and this is often said by people who don't realize just how terrible they are, but they say that as a throwaway. We all know that they're terrible. I'll just get something that says free range or organic, or um, I'll try to look for the stuff that says pasture raised, or maybe help the product guide me to something that seems a little nicer to animals. Um, I can avoid factory farm meat, right? Well, okay, so organic has nothing to do with how the animals are treated. Organic has to do with what's being fed to the animals. So that has nothing to do, organic has nothing to do with animal welfare. Free range doesn't mean anything. Basically, to have to be labeled as free range, all you have to do, you can have thousands of animals jam-packed into a shop. And they're so overcrowded, they're walking on each other, they're sitting on top of each other. But as long as you have a door that gives them access to an outdoor enclosure, it could be like a five foot by five foot muddy enclosure. As long as they have access to the outdoors, that's considered free range. Um, and something else that we have addressed. Oh, pasture fed, pasture um, fed for, uh, cows. Well, there was a report. I don't know if you guys saw the report on CNN um, about a month ago that actually showed how pasture-fed cows produce more um, to the greenhouse gases than, in fact, than you know, feedlot cows. There's no way that for the demand that we have for meat that we could possibly sustain that number of animals without having them factory farm. The other alternative is to grow meat in the lab, which is, is you know, it's, it's a whole different alternative where you're not dealing with the animal ethical issues. But to grow, with the current industry the way it is, there's no way we could meet that demand and have all these animals out free range. There, um, animal agriculture takes up one third of the total surface of Earth. One third it uses up the total surface of our planet just for animal agriculture. That's with factory farming. Think how much more it would take up if we had all these animals free range. It's just not. It's just not a practical. Any questions? Um, I was just, um, I'm a nurse and I also work in a hospital, and I was wondering, on one of my vegan websites, I found, I read where they found a new strain of MRSA in the Denmark pork, and they say there's a difference between um, hospital-acquired MRSA and the MRSA that they're finding in pigs. Hmm. And my concern is, if this new strain of MRSA comes and starts spreading in the hospitals, and I just have concerns thinking that really the MRSA wasn't started in the hospitals. Do you know where MRSA actually was started? No, so MRSA is methicillin-resistant staph aureus. And basically, it means that it's a staph infection that's resistant to methicillin, which is one of our most crucial antibiotics. MRSA is something that we find happening a lot with people who are in the hospital. Being in the hospital puts you at risk, too, because you're very prone to catching infectious diseases while you're in the hospital, and MRSA is one of them. And you were mentioning that there are some pigs from Denmark that have MRSA. Yeah, I don't, a new strain. It's a, a new strain of MRSA. I don't know anything about that, but that's definitely worrisome because what people may not realize is that our meat is produced all over the world. You, we have no idea. Cows are shipped and inter-shipped inter all the time. And cows, pigs, and chickens. Most of our pork actually comes from um, China. It's one of the largest exporters of pork. I don't know about the, the, the pork from Denmark, but um, I would assume that at least some of that gets over here to the United States as well. Unfortunately, I don't know much more about it, but that's certainly troubling. Mm -hmm. thank you. So thank you, that was an amazing talk. Thank um, you. The question that I have for you is, as, a, as also a health professional, a pulmonary critical care physician, I worry about antibiotic resistance. Uh -huh. Can you comment a little bit? Yeah. Because as you know, factor farming is such a huge issue with antibiotic resistance. Yeah, so um, the question was about antibiotic resistance and factory farming. So in the 1970s, it was found that by feeding animals in factory farms low and continuous levels of antibiotics, 
They were able to help fatten the animals, help them grow really fast, and survive in these poor conditions. So factory farms really depended on using antibiotics to keep these animals alive. And so that has created superbugs in the farm. And there is no doubt that there is overwhelming evidence that feeding these animals antibiotics on the farm, not because they're not, not to treat diseases, but to, to help them grow because the environments are so miserable. They, these animals need all the help they can get. So, the, but the feeding of, of these um, antibiotics to animals in factory farms has certainly contributed to antibiotic resistance for us as well. It's not the only cause of antibiotic resistance in humans. I mean, we, we're kind of not using antibiotics very judiciously ourselves. But factory farming use of antibiotics is certainly a very high contributing factor. Right, yeah. Hi. Um, I work in the public education system, and as of right now, what we are still teaching in schools um, is completely, like, knowledge is power. And as a teacher, you know, my students ask me all the time why I leave the mental reasons why, because we thought they actually saved my life. Um, why are we still, as a public education system and the federal government, why are we still teaching lies about the benefits of meat and dairy when there are other substitutes. I mean, in our food pyramid that we still teach, milk is still in there, and it's not, I mean, I just, I mean. So the question is, why are like, our public health institutions and our education institutions, despite all the evidence, still sort of, you know, um, promoting dairy products and meat and not, not teaching people the health problems about it? I think one of the main reasons why that still occurs is because most people in public health and in our federal government eat meat and dairy themselves. It was easier for the, for the public health institutions to come out against tobacco back in the day because most of them weren't, by that point, weren't smoking tobacco. Most of the people in public health and doctors were no longer smoking um, tobacco. So it, it, there wasn't that personal stake there. And I think that these folks are just like everyone else in the population. They eat animals, so it's hard for them to get beyond and to think about what that could mean and um, you know, what, how that affects our public health. And you know, it's very disappointing. When we had the swine flu um, back in 2009 and 2010, you guys might remember the swine flu we had. Um, you know, it, <coughs> The studies really, and evidence really suggested that it started from a, uh, what is a pig farm, Smith, Smithfields, I think it was, in Mexico, in a small town in Mexico. Because the first human case occurred in that town where there was um, this huge pig factory farming industry in, over there. And um, despite the fact that we, there was really strong evidence that the swine flu started from this factory farm. The, if you guys may remember, our government quickly, quickly, quickly wanted to downplay the link with pigs. And, you know, they, they tried to say you can't get swine food from eating pork. And that's correct. That was correct. But what they didn't tell people was that the very source of swine food likely came from pig factory farms. And that was incredibly disappointing. And I don't know why, how we're going to get people to think beyond that. But I think that the World Health Organization announcement recently was a major step in that direction. I think for them to make that announcement, and you guys saw all the vitriol and the reaction against it, but for the World Health Organization to make that announcement about red and processed meat, it was a major positive step. And I think we're going to see more findings and announcements following that. Okay. Um, hold on just a second. Are we having an issue with the mic? Oh, we're changing out the battery. Okay. So I'm really relying on my volunteers to notice you, so you don't hand out, hang out there with your hand, you know, hanging in the air. So my way back there. So we have one in the back. She's she's third. Um, but we had red hat right here was next, um, and then right there with the stripe, and then um, back there, you're third. Who else has a question? We're gonna number you first. so you know. You're first. Okay. Well, well, let me go ahead and get our order figured out so we know where the mic's going. Okay, so you're first, second, third, fourth. Who else has a question? We have time for questions. Fifth, right here. All right, so we got five, 
six. We got six questions lined up. You, do my volunteers see where these folks are? Awesome. Okay, go right ahead. Seven. Okay. Seven. <laughs>
um, highlight this type of information. I know that you said that people are, uh, and we all know that uh, pro meat people are really sensitive about you know, their <laughs> lifestyle, if you will. Uh, and on top of that, you have industries who are very powerful, like the tobacco industry, on par with that, that are very, um, you know, they have interest. So what type of um, pushback do, do you guys receive, and how do they also receive whoever they are, receive this information when you uh, put it out? Um, so we're, we're, you know, there's the same pushback, I get the same pushback as anyone else. Except that I will say, what's really nice is, you know, I think there's, um, there's a statement that you, you know how effective you are by how much the opposition really hates you. <laughs> and there's this, like, there's this animal, um, pro-animal testing group that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty nasty. And one year they made a big deal in their year finale about how they wrote against my work. And that was one of their, you know, claims to fame, right? And I thought, wow. They made a big deal that they kind of wrote something opposite me. And so that suggests that what I'm saying is actually irking them, right? And so they feel that it's effective. So I think that the more so we're getting more scientists and other doctors who are starting to talk about these issues um, on animal testing, on the health problems with meat and dairy. Um, and um, so with, with more people talking, and being more effective, we are going to see more pushback. But that's good. That suggests that we're actually being effective. Yeah. So I have two friends who are vegetarian, but are not making the connection, the health connection with veganism, and they're still saying that dairy and eggs are really important to their diet. What response would you have for that? So dairy, think of dairy as liquid meat. And it's really nasty when you think about it that way. It's liquid meat. Dairy is probably one of the worst things. And I'll say it's probably worse than red meat for our health. It is absolutely horrendous for our health. Dairy is being shown to cause, um, to be a major risk factor for prostate cancer in men, uh, which is one of the main causes of cancer in men, and for breast cancer in women. It is led to um, all kinds of autoimmune diseases, arthritis, um, asthma, you name it, dairy is linked to it. And um, so I don't know what else to say except that um, there are some great sites out there that show the health problems with dairy. There's a site called nutritionfacts.org. It might have Dr. Michael Greger. If you've heard of him, he has some great information about that. But dairy is, is honestly one of the worst things. If she cut out dairy and still ate meat, like red meat, she would probably be doing better for her health than the other way around. Next question. Hey, thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, my big question is, you know, especially for vegetarians, so often we hear things about, uh, you know, issues, you know, with these big factory farms, and kind of go, okay, well, I'm doing my part, but so recently, so many things you see in the news are, you know, E. coli and Osteria and things in, in spinach and in broccoli and these huge, you know, you know, farms for that. So I guess the question is, you know, what is happening that that's happening more and more? And you know, what takeaway can we have? What do we do? There's a lot of reasons why, way. yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why vegetables are we're seeing a higher incidence of outbreaks. One is that we're looking more for these outbreaks, so we're finding them. We have better ways of detecting these outbreaks, um, like the salmonella and E. coli. The other is that the, the, we're so mass producing these products now that there's so many points along the processing line where these products can get contaminated. Um, by human, by humans as well, and and what is rarely discussed, if at all, is the link between the contamination of our crops and the manure that's coming out from factory farms, and that's really really troubling. I mean, no one really talks about that, and you have to dig deep to find it, but it's there. Um, so I think those are some of the main reasons why we're seeing that um, more incidents of things like spinach and and other fruits and veggies being contaminated with. With these bacteria. I don't know what to do about it other than standing here and trying to talk to people like you guys and, and just trying to get the message out, but um, those are the reasons why we're seeing more of them. Okay, who was number four? Okay, you were number four? Okay. <laughs> 
again, as everyone said, thank you for, for your for your talk and for being here. You're clearly very passionate and so well informed about this, your topics. But I noticed that you work for the government, and I wondered what kind of a conflict that is. <laughs> 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 direct opposition to the, their basic ideas that they're promoting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it is. Uh, so, you know, I always say I work for the government. I don't know. Who knows how long it will last when they finally start saying, well, they're sick and tired of me going around here, and I'm going to kick me out. But for now, I'm still there. And um, um, actually, I'm, I'm kind of lucky in a sense that even though my co-workers in my office disagree with me, they respect my right to express myself. And so, which, you know, we hope that everyone would. So the government actually protects our freedom of speech, you know? Uh, at least we like to think it does. And in this case, it, it does, at least for me. So, um, uh, you know, there's been a few but butting heads um, every now and then, but for the most part, um, we're respectful of each other's opinions and we try to work with each other. And I think that um, they, people respect at least my ideology to wanting to eliminate our suffering animals. They might think that we're nowhere near where we can do that. And I think, of course we can do it. It's so easy to eliminate the suffering of animals, at least human um, induced suffering of animals. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a respectful environment. Yeah. But you know, it can change from office to office. I know some people who, some folks who work at NIH where they've had more contentious um, environment. So I, I just think it's sort of wrong. It's going to be black sheep. <laughs> yeah. I've always been the black sheep, so I guess I'm used to it. All right, everyone, I think that we are at time for this talk. So please, thank Dr. Arthur.